Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Marav Fine. I'm a program manager for member services at the Jewish Funders Network here in New York. And today we have a webinar about communications and philanthropy. We will have several experts on this call, Joanne Mort, a JFN member, Julie Silverstein, and Tamar Snyder um, of the Jewish Communal Fund. We're really excited about having you all on this call. We'll also, sorry, have Hasai Westbrook who works with Joanne. Um, great, great presenters and a great, great amount of information that we're going to be learning today about how to communicate better in philanthropy, how communication impacts um, our messaging and our the grantees that we work with. It's really exciting. So without further ado, um, we're going to kick it off with Joanne Moritz. Um, thanks, Mirab. Um, I, uh, as Mirav mentioned, she actually said that I was a member of JFN. I'm not a member, but I used to, <laughs> I used to be uh, part of the communications team at JFN. I was director of communications several years ago. Uh, I left um, nine, about nine years ago to start my own consulting firm. And um, Hasdai Westbrook, who's my partner in this, uh, was also with me at Jewish Funders Network. And his, Hasdai's specialty is digital media and social media, although he's also an extraordinary strategist. And we've been asked to um, concentrate on the issue of strategy today um, among um, <clears throat> the topics to be discussed. So Hasdai will be available in the Q&A, um, but I'm going to focus more on the strategic piece in this now. Hasdai and I just formed something new, as if we didn't have enough uh, titles under our, under our names called Maximum Impact, and it's specifically geared to serve foundations and donors on their um, strategic communications work. Um, so I'm going to start taking you through the slides. This, um, sorry, I'm just having my head and my uh, <laughs> phone and my heart uh, line up here. Um, is everybody seeing, I just started our slides. Mirav, I'm not seeing our slide come up on the screen. Um, is everybody seeing it? No, you should just be able to move that. There you go. There it is. Okay, so there's a bit of a delay. Okay. So that's who we are. You can see our photos. Um, we do like to smile. We don't always smile in our pictures. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, there's really a delay here. I'm sorry, but the slides are not moving. Here we go. Okay. So this is the proverbial um, tree in a forest falling, and um, uh, um, we would say that this guy, this little guy who's fallen, is not an expert in strategic communications. If no one can hear you, if you fall, it just doesn't matter. And, in, and, and equally so, the, the best work that you're doing um, on behalf of your donor, or if you are the donor, it doesn't matter if nobody knows about it. Now, what do we mean by that? We don't mean, and I know that, that often there's an interest in doing anonymous uh, fundra uh, funding. And of course, as we all know from Maimonides, um, that's in fact something that we're taught early in our Jewish education, that anonymous funding is at the top of the ladder in philanthropy. But we're not talking about just getting your name out there. We're talking about something beyond just the visibility and just getting the buzz and just what's commonly known as public relations. We're talking about harnessing the power of media, networks, technology as a core part of your mission. Strategic communications, the reason we use the word strategic is it means creating a communications overlay to all of your work. You have to start by asking yourself, what is your mission and what are your goals, just as you do before you put money on the table to do your grant making. And you have to ask these same questions of your grantees. The difference is when you ask these questions, you then add to the answer, how can communications uh, help to achieve these goals and this mission? Communication simply cannot be an afterthought. Uh, part of the key to a strategy in this arena is being aware of all of the unintended consequences. What could happen to derail your work? What could happen to augment your work? Now, this is why you have to be prepared. Um, this, is a, this is a photo from a recent example a 
of a situation that probably um, most of the people on this call are familiar with or read about, uh, the Jerusalem Open House, which supports LGBTQ activists in Jerusalem and gets support from a lot of uh, the Jewish donors who are members of the Jewish Funders Network, or a significant number of them, was invited. They were invited to Chicago recently by a, another nonprofit called A Wider Bridge, and it's a group that seeks to encourage U.S.-Israel conversation on the LGBTQ issue. This was to, supposed to take place at a national conference in Chicago, and anti-Israel activists got wind of this. They first tried to exclude the Jerusalem Open House from the conference overall. That failed. So then instead they decided to storm the reception on Shabbat, and it resulted in this scene that you see. It was quite ugly and became violent. The police had to shut the entire thing down. So instead of the conversation that was anticipated and desired to talk about how to protect and enhance LGBTQ rights in Jerusalem, the violent demonstration became the public conversation and the media-driven conversation, and especially the social media-driven conversation. And there were different versions um, around on what had happened. I was called in after the fact to, um, for, by one of the um, uh, friend of mine who is a leading rabbi in the community and um, had been had been on site at that time and was asked to write an op-ed for Haaretz about what happened. Um, and we wrote it and we tried to regain the conversation and make a lot of the arguments that should have been made it made in the beginning of um, of this uh, of this whole happening. Um, the problem is that um, the conversation really just was uh, gotten away with. And now the debate still to this day, a month out, month and a half out, is is there any Semitism in the LGBTQ community? Is there manipulation among um, the grantees of what should be done and what shouldn't be done? The, the attempt to create a positive message to build allies for the Jerusalem Open House was, was seriously hurt because there wasn't enough thought given early on to how to put communications into play before this reception and this event. What do you need to do <clears throat> excuse me, to have a success in communications? You need to anticipate, you need to inoculate, and you need to advocate. You need to anticipate a negative climate, Sorry about that. You need to anticipate a negative climate, create an armor by messaging the narrative you want to come out of it. You have to get it out. I'm oh, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt myself here, but Marav, these slides seem to be moving around. You're not moving them, are you? I am not moving them. Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, you need to anticipate a negative climate and create an armor by messaging the narrative you want to come out of it. You need to get it out in advance, as I said, in an op-ed, on social media, talking points distributed to allies. It's one of the most important things to do that, that can be done completely for free. Um, make sure that all of the people with whom you're engaged, people who will be at an event that you're supporting or engaged in a program that you're working on, have talking points and know why you're doing what you're doing and can, can help to provide an echo chamber uh, for the work that you're doing. Number three, you want to inoculate by telling the story that you want told, not the one that others will tell about you. And as I mentioned in the case of Jerusalem Open House, what they needed to do was what they wanted to do was tell a very, very important story, which is how when they had the um, recent uh, pride rally in Jerusalem, um, there was a hate crime committed, a young teenage supporter of, um, of Jerusalem Open House was actually killed, was murdered by an ultra-Orthodox man who had been let out of prison for a similar hate crime um, and is now back in prison. This is an extraordinary important message. The work that Jerusalem Open House does on behalf of all of the religions um, that are centered in Jerusalem, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, was something else very important and it all got eclipsed by what happened. So you want to advocate for a proactive message that embraces your audience and it also would engage them and in helping to meet your goals. Now obviously this was an extreme situation that I've used to, to, uh, as an example, but less extreme situations would, would require the same sort of really very simple three thoughts, anticipate, inoculate, advocate. 
I want to talk just briefly about how you can consider different parts of an arsenal, um, of things in an arsenal for communications that, um, that you may not normally consider. Um, uh, one of the other presenters is going to talk about media, so we aren't going to be talking about media at this moment. Um, but I want to, when I, I previously was head of communications for U.S. programs for the Open Society Foundation for the Soros, George Soros' foundation, before I went to work with Jewish Funders Network. And we, we had, obviously this was a foundation that's very advocacy driven, um, and we were able to really experiment with lots of interesting ways to um, create communications vehicles. So I just want to touch on a few of them that you see here. First of all, as I said, you want to think of your goals, you want to think of branding, you want to figure out how you do storytelling, earn media, social media, but then there are other things that are available to you. So looking at the pictures that are up here, we had, first of all, access to op-ed writers and writers who were also practitioners, like the, the late Anthony Lewis, Tony Lewis, who was a very famous New York Times correspondent and then columnist an expert on issues around civil rights. He wrote a book called Gideon's Trumpet, which became the iconic book to talk about defense for poor people, the right to criminal and civil defense for poor people in prisons in, in the United States, which is a core part of the funding that we were doing at Soros. So we made use of his book and we made use of him, which meant we stayed in close touch with him. We fed him stories through our grantees. We presented him speaking because he had a larger megaphone than any of us, and we made sure <clears throat> that there was this open transmission. Secondly, you'll see in the middle a picture of Brian Stevenson. Brian's book called Just Mercy has been on the New York Times bestseller list recently. He's an extraordinary lawyer um, and whose uh, organization, the um, Equal Justice Initiative based in Birmingham, Alabama, was a core grantee of the Soros Foundations at the time. But we also used Brian because he's such an important messenger and not only an excellent writer and an excellent lawyer and an excellent law, law professor, but somebody who speaks and can turn a crowd of hundreds of thousands in a room around issues of death penalty and indigent defense. So look for messengers. And this is something I think the Jewish community has been doing more and more in funding entrepreneurs and other people who have interesting stories to tell. Make sure that when they have their stories to tell, that they're ready to be able to tell those stories. You've given them everything they need and they're proactive in doing that. We created a newsletter called Ideas for an Open Society, which we printed and we also sent out online. And we sent it to every elected official, starting with a uh, mayor of 100,000 people over through to the entire U.S. Congress. We built forums around these ideas that we wrote about. We sent the ideas out as an op-ed to the newspapers. We pitched them to the media. Look for ways to repurpose the materials that you're creating. And then finally, we had this extraordinary opportunity to um, support a play called The Exonerated, which was performed off-Broadway for several years with A-list actors who were playing people who were in um, who had been exonerated from death row. And we made use of that with something called Talkbacks, which we created, which put our grantees in the theater with the actors and the audience after each performance so they could have conversations to extend the issue and have action items also addressing those. Um, Talkbacks have become very popular now, and it's a terrific way to, in any of the events that you're part of, to engage afterwards to keep the people who are there as active participants in what's happening. Now, I just want to very briefly touch on another large foundation, the Ford Foundation, and just ask you, what do you think about when you think about the Ford Foundation? Historically, we've thought of global development, education, democracy, support for the arts. But now, today, the Ford Foundation, in a strategic rethink, has completely changed the way that they are doing their philanthropy, and what they're doing is funding issues around inequality. So if you go to the Ford Foundation website, fordfound.org, you will see the website completely handed over to different aspects of fighting inequality, a very good, fairly easy way to engage in strategic communications. 
So you're probably all sitting there saying, okay, well, these guys are giving away millions, billions of dollars um, a year. What, we don't have that kind of money. Well, what do you have that they don't have? What do you need? What do you need? What you need is you need to know that you're out there in front, that you put communications at your table, and that your money will keep seeding and supporting good causes and important efforts. You just need to make the effort to have the impact. You don't need the billions of dollars. You can empower your grantees. You can empower yourself. You can empower your donor by understanding that communications has to have a seat at the table. Thank you so much, Joanne. Um, we're going to be hearing now from Julie Silverstein. Thank you, Mayra. Can you hear Hi. me? Yeah, we can hear you. Great. And have you transferred control to the slides over? Yes, you ha you should be able to move them. I just moved that first one. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, May Raz, and thank you, Joanne, for so forcefully articulating the case for why a strong communication strategy is important. My name is Julie Silverstein. I'm the founder and CEO of Trope, a messaging development firm committed to changing the world with words. We support corporate, nonprofit, and government clients with epic messaging that is informed by research, powered by authenticity, and inspired by the human story. Among wonderful clients, I am currently servicing family foundations of Jewish Funders Network members. Now, I'd like to turn from the why to the how of communication and one of the hottest trends in philanthropy, storytelling. And it doesn't seem that I'm able to move the slides. Ah, okay. Right. So telling stories is something I help our clients do every day. And it is no surprise that a major study by Georgetown University showed that 96% in our industry believe storytelling is a vital part of an organization's communication strategy and that the importance of storytelling will only increase over the next two years. May Rob, I'm gonna to have to ask you to move the slides because it doesn't appear that, uh, did you move that or did I do that? I moved it for you. I'm not sure what the issue is. We'll discuss it after, go ahead. Okay, great. All right, if you could advance to the next slide, thank you. As Jewish funders, of course, we know that the tradition of storytelling is also an ancient one with deep roots in our heritage from the retelling of the Passover story to colorful Yiddish writers and Hasidic stories. Therefore, we should embrace storytelling not as a brand fad, but as truly authentic and powerful expression. So in the next 12 minutes, we're going to talk about why stories work, how foundations are using storytelling, the architecture of a great story, and how you can make storytelling a priority within your organization. Slide, please. So why do stories work? Over the last three years, the New York Times has covered some fascinating new research on the neuroscience of the brain. What do we see in brain scans when someone reads stories? Next slide. So this research shows that stories not only activate the areas of the brain responsible for language processing, but also unexpected regions. Smell words like apple activate the areas of the brain devoted to smell. And this is true for texture words in the sensory cortex or motion words in the motor cortex. The brain, it seems, does not make much of a distinction between reading or hearing about an experience and encountering it in real life, which can explain for the readers among us why the experience of reading can feel so real. And stories can even go beyond simulating a reality to give readers an experience unavailable off the page the opportunity to enter fully into the thoughts of others or into far off locales to experience a problem they didn't know existed. And this small fact of neuroscience is deeply important to the work of foundations. I recently met with a husband and wife who are JFN members and now formally establishing their own family foundation. I remember walking into their beautiful home with a cascading spiral staircase and I could already feel the cool of the husband's skepticism. Next slide, please. 
Now, I assure you that this is not an actual picture of the husband, but it's a pretty good approximation of his skepticism. So he asked me, why on earth would I make an investment in storytelling when I can devote that allotment directly to my charitable giving? And the reason is that storytelling leverages your philanthropic impact. A $100 gift to a local Jewish day school can be a meaningful charitable gift, but the same amount given as a message gift with a story has an exponential impact. This impact has public-facing utility, of course, indicating to the grant recipient what is the foundation's vision for change, signaling to partners what types of values the foundation espouses, and the impact has internal-facing utility as well. A story is a tool for hiring and training staff, creating alignment across the board or even intergenerational family members. So the wife got it, and after a few minutes, the husband got it, and I left their house feeling the magnitude of what we could do together. Next slide. Now, I'd love to jump into three case studies exploring how foundations are using storytelling today. Let's start with the Rockefeller Foundation. Slide, please. The Rockefeller Foundation issued a challenge to its nonprofit grantees to share the impact they've had on individuals and communities through what they called the Rockefeller Foundation Storytelling Challenge. And now here's how they set up the challenge. They offered two awards of 50000 each for operating support. They selected qualified and impartial judges, put them under a nondisclosure agreement, and developed weighted scoring criteria. The 2015 winners were Global Minimum Inc. and Ashoka, and there was tremendous media coverage of the contest. Next slide, please. On to our next case study, the Skoll Foundation, which invests in social entrepreneurs. Because they believe that partnerships are critical for scaling innovations to affect large-scale change, Skoll created a special partnership category they called Storytelling Partnerships. What school does is they select these high-quality storytelling partners across multiple platforms, radio, television, print, film, to, quote, drive broad awareness of social entrepreneurs and their innovations, engage influential audiences, spur conversation, and drive action. And these school foundation storytelling partners currently include the Sundance Institute, National Public Radio, Public Radio International, PBS NewsHour, and Harper One, a very impressive group of partners. Next slide, please. And, our, and for our third example um, of storytelling, we go to the Gates Foundation. Now, if you visit Seattle and you cross off the Space Needle, head across the street to the Gates Foundation Visitor Center. Now, few of us are, of course, large enough to build our own dedicated visitor centers, but we do have offices that host convenings and we invest in capital building projects for our grantees. So think about how these spaces could be used differently. The Gates Visitor Center is a tribute to the power of storytelling through immersive and interactive exhibits. They have a station called Draw Your Cause, where you can draw the story of your own nonprofit or foundation, decide your funding priorities, and engage in a debate about critical issues. They have another station that addresses access to clean drinking water in rural villages, where you have to lift heavy pails of water, of simulated water, and walk a distance across the lobby. Uh, which reminds us that stories can also have an experiential component. Next slide, please. So the wheels are turning. We're seeing why stories matter, and we want to start writing. So let's dig in, into the craft of storytelling. We could spend hours, of course, on this alone, but I'm going to run us through the highlight store. Storytelling for foundations is not just a sweet, improvised bedtime story, although I'm sure we'd all like a good bedtime story right now. The ones that achieve real change are strategically conceived, executed, and measured. Next slide. So I always start with what I call a master narrative, and that guides the creation of individual stories. The master narrative includes these five components. Slide, please. The audience, your foundation serves the people, what they want for their lives, the objective, the problem that stands in the way, the solution your foundation is advancing, and a call to action that creates a sense of purpose and offers the opportunity for partners, grant recipients, or a wider audience to take a specific action. Next slide. With a master narrative in place, we then move on to identify the appropriate story type. There are generally three different types of stories that I write for foundations. Who am I stories, what I'm doing stories, and where I'm going stories. Next slide. 
So the first major type is who I am stories. These are stories that highlight core values. This might take the form of a behind-the-scenes personalized and get-to-know-you piece. It could be an origin narrative about an idea that went on to change the world. It might also be a partnership story about the people who joined forces with you or your audience to create bigger change. Next slide. And the second major type is the what I'm doing story. This tends to be a story about accomplishments. I might write an on-the-ground piece about impact. It could be a transformation story about a single individual overcoming an obstacle, a context story, demystifying a complex issue, or even a mistake story about learning from a well-made failing, all highly effective. And next slide. And the third category of stories is what I call the where I'm going stories. It should speak to your vision for the future. In this category, I write solution stories about the newest approaches that are giving people hope and inspiring philanthropic work. Another story I write frequently is what I like to call an unfinished story about the work to be done, one that poses more questions and answers and invites the reader in. Next slide. So now we've heard an array of story types. We've selected our story types. Let's now address the craft of individual stories. Next slide, please. So I opened my talk by referencing a situation where I had to explain to a client the importance of storytelling. This was a very short story, but it followed an important arc. It had a sequence of events with a beginning, middle, and end, and it had a setting. Mayrav, are the slides stuck? Ah, okay. And one more slide, please. It had a problem, stakes a climactic moment, and a resolution. It was short, but shared a few vivid details. It was honest, and therefore relatable and personable. And if your story has these components, you're off to a great start. Next slide. Now here's where most of us stop, where we really should begin, because stories must not only be told, they must be heard. Storytelling is successful only when there's a community of people who want to discover and share our stories because they hold this common interest. And I'm talking about engagement. Next slide. So choosing the right platform for engagement is critical. The platform might be your website or newsletter. It might be Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest. Now, digital strategists who advise in this area are going to want to know what's your objective and what do you know about your audience? How old are they? Where do they live? What do they like? What type of content do they assume? These types of questions are going to guide your choice of platform. Next slide. Now let's take a closer look at just one platform, which is probably the go-to for most of us on the call, our website. Do you have share buttons enabled so that supporters and partners can share your stories on their own social media channels? Where did you put your stories? Are they on your homepage? Over two-thirds of organizations that put stories on their website put it on a content level page. That means multiple clicks. So don't make your audience work for it. Use your website to take your audience on a journey. Don't use it as a repository for information. Next slide. Now, as you consider making storytelling an organizational priority, it will be important to evaluate the success of your efforts just as you evaluate the impact of your giving. There are, of course, free dashboard tools attached to just about every digital platform, from Google to Facebook to measure reach and engagement. You can even look at the storytelling campaigns of like foundations with tools like BuzzSumo to see what worked and what didn't. You don't have to guess. Assumptions in this digital age are unacceptable. Know, learn, and maximize your storytelling impact. Next slide, please. And finally, let's take it home. So back to your organization or foundation. How can you make storytelling a priority at your foundation? According to the Georgetown study I referenced earlier, the biggest reported barrier to storytelling was not surprisingly, the unavailability of staff resources, with three and four organizations spending less than 5% of their annual budget on storytelling. Now, if storytelling isn't already a part of your organization, after this webinar, you'll need to address two things, mindset and capacity. Consider taking some of these questions with you to your next board or staff meeting. With respect to mindset, do we believe in the value of storytelling? Next slide. Are staff encouraged to share stories? Are they able to tell stories that clearly articulate the mission? Are stories incorporated into your foundation's regular communication? And when stories are successful, are these successes shared? Are staff encouraged to develop their storytelling skills through professional development or the adoption of new technologies? Next slide. And there are other questions we can ask with respect to capacity and staff resources. Do staff meet regularly to share and discuss these stories? 
is storytelling incorporated into at least, at least one staff member's core job duties? Does the staff member possess the necessary skills in writing and production? Is there an organized system for storing story assets and completed stories in a way that allows staff to easily access them? So you might also use the next meeting to tell a story, share a time when a story made a difference. Share a time when a story could have made a difference. Change their thinking about what a commu com communication strategy entails. Next slide. So no discussion of stories could be complete without Ellie Wiesel, one of our greatest storytellers. People become the stories they hear and the stories they tell. Whether he was speaking to the neuroscience or just the facts that we all understand to be true, Storytelling is a powerful communication strategy and a transformative investment. Next slide. Thank you for learning with me, and thank you to JSN for the opportunity to share this webinar stage with Joanne and Tamar. I've included our website and my personal email should you wish to follow up, and I look forward to your questions at the end of the call. Thanks, Mirav. Thank you all, and thank you so much, Julie, um, and also to Joanne for your patience. I'm not sure what the story is, but we're going to move on to Tamar. Um, Tamar, are you okay with your slides? Yeah, I'm great. <laughs> Fabulous. Okay, so I look forward to hearing from Tamar now, and uh, we'll take any questions at the end. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Mayrav, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. Um, this is a favorite topic of mine, and uh, it's wonderful to share this with you. So as a brief um, introduction, just to give you a sense of, of who I am and my background, I'm the Director of Brand Marketing and Communications at Jewish Communal Fund. We're the largest and most active donor revised fund in the country. And before joining JCF, I worked for several years at the New York Jewish Week, where I actually wrote about the Jewish nonprofit world. So I come at this from both sides. And I'm often asked, you know, how do I get my, my uh, foundation, my project, my organization um, in the Jewish Week or in other related papers, um, Jewish media, other media, secular media, philanthropy media, whatever it is. What, what are some key tips? So that's what we're going to go over today. And um, I tried to keep it as practical as possible um, to really you know, drill down to, to details. So before we get started and before I share the five uh, best practices, let's just go over the question of why generate media attention. It might seem pretty obvious. Everyone loves positive publicity, but there are, um, there are many foundations, especially smaller family foundations, that tend to prefer their privacy and say, you know, what's really in it for me? Why should I bother with, um, you know, reaching out to the media and having people cover our, our projects and our stories? So the first one is obviously free advertising. Um, you know, and if you're having someone on staff who's working on, on generating publicity, so it might not be entirely free, but the point is you're, you're not paying for an ad. Um, and even more important than that, when, when an article is written by, by, by a journalist, it, it's much more trustworthy. It's, it's you know, taken at a, at a lot of, um, it has more credibility than if it's, um, you know, if they, someone just sees an ad about what you're doing. Um, and then this is really important for search engine optimization. So if you want people to, to be searching for um, you know, your organization as one of the top organizations working on, uh, let's say, poverty or um, disabilities, um, when you come up and you have an article that shows up as you know, covering that area, that really helps you with search engine optimization. And oftentimes it's the blogs or, or smaller publications that seem to have very good SEO, but may not be like the brand name paper that actually could help you um, with SEO more than, more than the, those brand name papers. So you, know, you might want to have a different strategy when you're, looking, when you're thinking about SEO. Um, brand awareness is always important. You want people to know about you, know what you do, and that obviously will help increase donations and partnerships um, and help you achieve your goals at the end of the day. That's, that's really what you want to do. Okay, so let's get to the first strategy. Um, step one is telling a good story. I can't um, emphasize this enough, and I, I love the way Julie put it when she said that storytelling leverages your philanthropic impact um, and that you could have an exponential impact through that, and that, that is so true. You really want to make sure before you write that press release, before you prepare that pitch, am I telling a good story? You know, is this something I, – I always use the um, – the, uh, 
you know, mindset of would my mother or would my grandmother, would they want to read this? Is this something that would interest them? You know, if this is not the thing they're spending their whole life on, is this something that they would find really captivating and say, oh, let me forward this to someone. Let me share this on Facebook. Um, using that as, as a, you know, as a tool is, is really helpful to ask yourself that before, before you send that pitch, before you put that press release out. And it's really important to focus less on your own foundation or organization and more on the impact you're having. So obviously at the bottom of the press release, you know, you write about your whole organization, but people really want to know what, what, how, how is this changing the world? What difference is this making? How is this news um, you know, impacting me, impacting my family, impacting the people around me? So I'll, I'll give you an example. Let's say your foundation just hired a new executive director or CEO. So there are some places like the Chronicle of Philanthropy where they have, you know, a coming it's comings and goings where they, they list um, new hires and they'll sometimes even interview them. So you might want to pitch something like that. But most papers don't don't really, you know, a new a new hire is not such an exciting news. It's not, um, you know, in their mind. For you, it's super exciting. For them, a little less so. So you might want to reframe it when you're thinking about in the storytelling technique, what, what's interesting to them, and reframe it as a pitch where you could say, I'm offering you an exclusive interview with, the exec with this brand new executive director on the new direction of the foundation or where, where this foundation is going, what, what, what this means for the future, and what this means for this, um, this issue that we're, we're so passionate about. So, um, but really make sure you tell a good story. That's key. Now, number two, share statistics. So us journalists, you know, we, we, we maybe know more as word people, but we really do like the numbers to back us up. Um, they add heft to articles. They make sure that, that the article isn't just something we think, but it's, there's actually numbers to back us up. Um, they give us that credibility. So numbers are our journalists' best friends, and having those numbers in your pitch and having those um, statistics available um, or research studies are really, really key. So if you're working on a specific area, an issue area, Make sure you know those numbers. Let's say it's a, you're, you deal with poverty. Uh, make sure you know what the poverty rate is in your, um, you know, among the demographic that you work with or among the geographic area where you work with. Uh, make sure you know what trends you've seen. Um, we'll talk more about that in a bit. Make sure you, you're, you know, you're able to, to share this information because um, journalists really like that. Then I wrote, no stats, create your own. So I don't, I don't mean make them up. <laughs> that would be really bad. I just mean you might want to conduct a study. Let's say the, the issue you're working on, there, there isn't really um, governmental research or there isn't you know, anyone else doing that, that research. So when you're doing your, your um, grant evaluations and you're anyway hiring you know, an outside independent firm to, um, to see how well your, your, your grant initiative is going, um, you know, share those results, assuming you know they're, they're results you want to share. Hopefully, they are, um, and and you know, have that survey be something that you make available. People, journalists especially, love data, so use that to your advantage. Okay, number three. This now, this one I, I find that people who don't come from a journalist background um, tend to have a hard time wrapping their heads around this. It, it just seems um, a little more difficult to them, but I'll. I'll hopefully explain. Uh, so you want to showcase the trends. So a lot of times we want to pitch the article and we want the entire article to be just about us, right, or just about our initiative. And there's a sense, or at least a worry, among many people I, I talk to that, you know, well, if we, if we pitch a trend and we, we talk about other people doing stuff in this field, you know, the journalist might just write about those people or, or that might take away from our, you know, getting into the story. Um, but I've often found that's not the case. Journalists love to, to be able to, to um, be you know, on the forefront of a trend and showcase a, a neighborhood that's rising um, or a, a lifestyle option that's becoming much more popular. People are doing this. And um, I call it the rule of threes. You, know, you have one example, you have two examples, it's not quite a trend, but suddenly you have three and you're golden. It's, it's, you know, it's something you could write about. Uh, it's not quite that simple, but <laughs> that, that definitely helps. And, and journalists do like having those three, three examples. Uh, that, that's a typical uh, layout. You might notice that as, as you look at some stories focusing on trends. So you might want to think about other partner organizations that you work with in, in the same you know, um, issue area that maybe you could team up with and you could talk about how you're working together to advance the field. And yes, so the article won't be all about you, but it's certainly a lot better than not having an article at all. 
Um, and it, it will be a stronger article because it will really talk about um, ways you're moving, you know, the impact that you're having as, as, a, as a group. So definitely consider that. Um, you know, and don't, don't think that if the story is not just all about you, then, then it's a waste. Uh, I would think that, that, you know, that, that, that would be a shame. So, so definitely try to, try to find those trends. Okay, so number four, take great pictures. This seems uh, kind of silly, but there are a lot of times where, where um, papers have a spot where they specifically feature photos, and as, you know, especially in the age of social media where everything is, is visual. Um, you want to think about in advance before the, before, the, um, before the event, before the ribbon cutting, before whatever it is, you know, where could we get those action shots? You know, and listen, I, I still take pictures you know, as a communications professional of the ribbon cuttings. I'm not saying don't do those, but try to find those action shots where you're able to show the beneficiaries of your work. Um, you're able to really show the impact that you're having. Um, you know, the, the child's face lighting up because they received a present you know, as part of a toy drive, that, that may, you know, means a lot more than just having a picture of a bunch of people uh, cutting a ribbon. Um, and just a, a caveat that when you're dealing with photos, you do want to make sure you have um, signed photo releases and that you have a, a, you know, a process in place to make sure that you have permission to, um, to release these photos, especially if, you, if your work um, involves children under the age of 18 or like in a school setting. Sometimes uh, schools will do like a release form to the parents when they're registering their children. So there, there are different ways to get around that, but it's, it's important to think that through before you um, start that strategy. And uh, lastly, just it's so important to be a helpful source, to be accessible, to answer your emails. If a journalist reaches out to you, you know, help them. Connect them to other helpful sources. Maybe the story they're working on really is not something your foundation is, is working on. Um, and maybe you're not the, quite the right person, but you, can, can, but you know somebody who would be helpful to them. You know, that, that will help you in the future. Um, you have to really think long term. So there might be experts or researchers that you're connected with that you could connect a journalist to or stats that you're aware of or research studies or, or even sometimes just talking on background. Maybe you don't quite have, um, you know, you can't be quoted right now, but you're willing to talk to them uh, on background um, and that, that's when they're, they're not quoting you. And you make sure that, that you, you both understand what's happening and you're, you're both agreeing to certain terms. Um, so that, that's always important. So I would say the key, the key takeaway is really this, this point that building a relationship um, with different reporters is a long-term effort. It's, it's not about just pitching, you know, how many pitches you could send out to journalists and how many press releases you could write. It's, it's really about building those long-term relationships. So hopefully that will help. And I, I have my contact information here, so I'm happy to assist anyone if anyone has questions after this webinar. And I think we're, we're Mira, are we going to start the question and answer session now? Yes, we are. Perfect. So for folks who have been listening in and watching, uh, thank you all so much. I'm going to unmute everyone. Um, the conference so has been unmuted. You'll all be able to participate. If your own lines are muted currently, you should unmute them so that you can ask questions. We have about 15 minutes to chat. Um, or if you'd like to type in a message, you can also do that as well. Hi, it's Dina Lidman from the Azrieli Foundation. Hello. I have a, hi, I have a question that sort of gets to um, the first presentation in the strategic where there's sort of this divide between being proactively strategic and being reactive. And one of our areas of, um, of funding and in fact our own um, programming is the area of Holocaust education and commemoration. And we have some amazing stories to tell because actually what we do is we tell stories. We publish the memoirs of Holocaust survivors who come to Canada, who came to Canada. And we have some wonderful, wonderful relevant stories. And what we have found every single time we go out to try and drum up interest among journalists or among any kind of media, or be it around Holocaust Education Week, International Holocaust Remembrance Day, um, you name it, the story we get back is we're Holocaust today. We're done. 
except when something major happens, and then it becomes reactive. And then what ends up happening is because nobody listens to our story when we have really positive things to tell, the only people they call when something bad happens is the people who spend their whole life talking about how the sky is falling. And, uh, you know, so then it be, how do we get ourselves, how do we position ourselves in a way that we become part of the people that they will call because we actually have an important story to tell in that realm? Um, that, that's a Standing great, on one foot, a really easy question. Yeah, no, it's actually, it's a really great question. I'm going to ask Hasdai actually to jump in here if it's okay with everybody because I just want to preface what, what he'll say by, by saying um, this, is where, this is where you have the power to create your own story and obviously social media is a big piece of this. Hasdai, do you just want to say something about that? Uh, I mean, yeah, so I think the sort of traditional model is that you have a story to kind of get out there to distribute to broadcast and that traditional media is, are the gatekeepers and amplifiers. Of course, traditional media still has a very important role to play. They do have uh, large megaphones, but they're now part of an ecosystem. And I think the important point to keep in mind is that you have now have the power at much lower cost than used to be the case um, to essentially build your own infrastructure and your own network. Um, you know, obviously there are many, many people who want to hear these stories who, for whom these stories resonate and uh, what you want to be doing on an ongoing basis, on a, you can call it proactive, but I call it simply community building, is, is continually building that network and that community. And that will involve strategically um, you know, mapping out the network of influencers and, and sort of quote-unquote megaphones, some of whom will be journalists uh, and media outlets, some of whom will not be because the media landscape is now much more complex and um, rich, uh, if you will, uh, with people, with organizations, with um, informal organizations of people who are interested in these topics, be it a, from, a, from you know, another foundation or, another organiz or other organizations that are, uh, have similar interests or outlooks or stories to something as informal as a Facebook group. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a member of various um, uh, Facebook groups that simply share photos, old photos, um, that tell stories about cities, for instance, and it's incredibly popular, and it's, it's, a, it's a very powerful way to get... Uh, you know, those stories out uh, to people for whom they would resonate. So again, I would reiterate that, you know, while it's important to um, still be thinking in terms of how we get our story out through traditional media, there is now a continuum uh, between um, the kind of media infrastructure that you can build and to a certain extent control by having that kind of community building outset um, and those traditional media outlets. Are there any tricks how to leverage that though because we do have a very good social media presence in that space and we've really tapped into things like Medium who will often post uh, material that, we, that we've created for us. And so we're using our own generated and other, other fora that are out there. But then mm -hmm. if something happens, or when we do want to then take this to a water, wider audience who aren't the people who self-select to be reading that material, um, mm -hmm. we hit a brick wall. Well, you know, one of the things you can do also is tweet it out to, which you may already be doing, but reporters increasingly, as Hasdai mentioned, the, it's not just that you're posting things on Facebook, but they're, tr they're trolling, they're looking for stories and angles on things. So tweeting out, doing a, putting together a list of reporters who you notice are covering the stories in the venues where you want to be, and then getting onto their Twitter feeds, tweeting to them, the same with Facebook. Um, getting the medium's great, and that's not, you know, we didn't even have a chance to talk about some of these new media forms that are out there, like Medium and Narratively and these other online publications. Um, but then not just settling for getting your, your, your uh, material in Medium, but then basically repurposing what's in Medium and getting it around to people. Um, and the other thing is I think in terms of the proactivity, you really have to be sort of 24-7 on it. You can't get ready just before there is a commemoration date, and especially with something like this, we know, um, you know, we know what the hallmarks are but you have to look for ways to build the story and give somebody something in advance to be able to, be able to do it. The other yeah, thing where you use so video, sorry, we didn't talk about video at all either. I mean, this is another, obviously, in something like this, video could be very impactful, and, and you can put that online too. Mm -hmm. 
I'd like to briefly answer the question as well. Um, this is Julie Silverstein. Um, I, I mean, I think that the, the, the absolute key to engagement is shared interest. I know it's, uh, we, we, you know, we have our own, you know, stories that we want to push out, but we have to think about how those stories are going to be heard and received. And while all the connections to the, the Holocaust may be self-evident to us, um, if we can clearly articulate how the issues that we care about may also be important to others, um, we should make that effort to do so, whether it's through, you know, one-pagers that might accompany um, our written material um, or through various social media um, means. And, Dina, this is Tamar. I just wanted to um, – the, the most recent article that I read recently about, about Holocaust um, – stories um, that, that struck a chord. I think it was in the Wall Street Journal was talking about how they're using virtual reality. I don't know if you saw that, that story um, to tell, uh, you know, to, to actually show Holocaust survivors telling their stories. So that was obviously, they were interested in that angle of innovation in telling stories. So that might yeah, be something. Yeah, we tried that angle because we just created an amazing <laughs> tool and we know that there's really good virtual reality stuff going on. I mean, that's the thing. We, you know, we've, Look, some of this, some of this becomes micro, right? We we what our cases, you know, we we took it to Wired magazine to say we have created this incredible digital media platform to teach mm -hmm. history in a new to a new generation using their language. That sounds fantastic, and that that didn't uh, didn't land. Uh, I would keep trying. Um, it might not yeah, land with that reporter or with that specific publication, but there are plenty of other publications that are you know interested right, in. And Sorry like to that. jump in. It's just that there, are, there are plenty of other publications and plenty of other tech blogs and things that are not as mass market as Wired. Um, mm -hmm. There's a whole, you know, again, another ecosystem of those that can be reached out to. So, I mean, okay. Wired is a big get, obviously, but um, th there are other options. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. There is another question, folks, um, to talking about Medium. What is Medium? Hello. Hello. Um, do you want to answer that, or do you want? Sure. I mean, Medium is essentially Medium is is created by some of the folks who were involved with Twitter. Uh, it's essentially an online blogging, blogging platform that provides a very simple interface and an online community for um, putting up your own stories, and um, it can be very helpful. Um, it's it, it's very it's very um, well integrated with other social media as well, so um, it can be a great way to get your own stories up and get them flowing through social uh, social media ecosystems. Great, thank you so much. Do we have any more questions? We have just a couple more minutes before we wrap up. I just um, I just wanted to say one more thing about Medium that I think people might find interesting. When Jonathan Greenblatt became the new head of the ADL, his announcement was put on Medium. It's so I think one of the things about doing media outreach is really thinking in advance, who is your target? Is your target looking for other donors so that you create strategic partners? In that case, maybe look at publications that are read by high worth individuals or by, um, or by philanthropists, or is your target young millennials, in that case you're looking at you know, things like medium or social media oriented things, is your target influencing the Jewish community, you're looking at the Jewish Week, the Forward, Haaretz, et cetera. Um, but that, that also really helps sort of put into play um, how you think about where you place things and the social media component. This is Julie Silverstein. Um, on, on Medium, you know, um, some of the trending articles are, um, are really boosted by staff picks. And if you can cultivate relationships with Medium staff members, um, let them know in advance you know, something that you're going to be posting um, and try to develop a mutually beneficial relationship around information sharing, um, you might be able to um, gain greater traffic for your post. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Um, I learned a lot. I'm sure the folks on this call learned a lot. I'm glad we were able to share some questions and get some feedback. Again, as a reminder, this call is recorded and will be posted so you can share it um, around and continue to use it as a resource. All of the email addresses of the folks who spoke today are on here. 
and I can share them in um, our follow-up information. If you have any additional questions that any of the folks on here can't answer, please feel free to reach out to me, and I'll do my best to help you out. Again, my name is Marav Fine. We've heard today from Joanne Mort from Hostai Westbrook, Julie Silverstein, and Tamar Snyder. Thank you all so much for all of your help and participation and work on this, and I look forward to speaking to all of you soon. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.